going to give a talk that's the antithesis of John Hughes's talk. Uh, I will show you how to do everything wrong in preparing and giving a talk. Um, <clears throat> mostly because I gave Derek Dreyer a title for this talk long before I thought about what I was going to put in for the content. Um, so um, it's supposed to be about highs and lows, and it's supposed to be a clever pun where I'm talking about my own career, which has vacillated between high-level programming languages and low-level programming languages. Um, but it's also about the fact that um, I think every researcher goes through periods of euphoria and depression. And how do you deal with that kind of uh, these wild swings when you're, when you're a researcher? So, uh, and also, finally, this talk will go all over the place. All right, so. Uh, okay, here's a favorite uh, slide from PhD Comics. She says, oops, time for my five, daily five-minute existential crisis. What am I doing with my life? What's the point? What am I going to do when I graduate? Okay, back to work. Okay, so, you know, that happens, at least happened every day for me in grad school, and it was not because Bob was my advisor. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, and, and furthermore, these are thoughts that I have today. Ugh, crap, this theory will never impact the real world. Or worse, this implementation will never last. Or this isn't solving an important problem, like cancer, uh, you know. <laughs> or... Nobody's going to find this interesting, or, geez, I'm bored with this topic, uh, or, oh, sheesh, these guys already solved this problem. I'm sure they did, right? Um, and I don't deserve to be here. Okay, so uh, I, think, I think researchers have these kinds of thoughts all the time. So one question is, when you encounter them, how do you, how do you dig out from that kind of uh, depression? So one, one thing is to value your own growth. That is, uh, instead of worrying about what other people are thinking about in terms of your research, think about what you want to gain from exploring some topic, what kind of personal growth you want to have. Value that, and then you can't lose. Okay? Uh, another one is, when you get stuck, it's great to have other topics to jump around on. And you'll see that that happened a lot for me in my career. And um, another thing is to get your hands dirty. So er many times I've read about a particular topic and it's some great set of papers on it, and I get depressed because I think I'll never be able to find a novel contribution. But the truth of the matter is, uh, authors are really bad. They never write the shortcomings of their work in their papers, right? And it's when you go redo the proof or recode or re-experiment that you realize, oh, there was something else here. They, they left on the table, and I can contribute. But you only find that out when you dig in and you really get your hands dirty with something. And then um, I find it very useful to explain work to somebody else when I'm depressed or down, just because they get excited and they give you feedback and you hear about what they're doing and it mixes things up. And then um, finally is to have some patience. So, so and, and you'll see why that, I think that's very important. Okay, a little bit of background about me. Um, I went to school at a little tiny liberal arts college in Richmond, Virginia. Um, was lucky enough to be admitted into Carnegie Mellon, uh, where I worked with a number of people, but Bob Harper here ended up being my advisor. After that, I graduated. I was even luckier, got a position as an assistant professor at Cornell, spent a number of years there, and then Harvard lured me away. So I went to Harvard for the last, oh, 12 years or so, and then um, Cornell lured me back. So, see, there's a theme here, up and down. Okay, back, back and forth. All right, so, um, and maybe, and, and those two babies are important. I'll come back to that point in a second. Okay, so the early years, just to set the stage, this was the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and most programs were written in C. Even C++ was not that popular at that stage. Um, and uh, part of the reason uh, I, I raise this, because later on you're going to see I'm interested in, in security and privacy, but security was not a topic of discussion at that point, okay? Uh, people just wrote their code in C, and I was disgusted. Okay, I thought, and I still believe, all programs should be written in a decent programming language. Uh, and C was not decent. What was decent? Well, language was decent if it was higher order, garbage collected. So, so far, all you scheme guys are happy. And then, strongly statically typed, ideally with good modules, <laughs> IEML. Okay. <laughs> 
So, so that was to me what was a good programming language. And I was really on a mission as a grad student to try to convince systems people that they should stop coding in C and instead they should write all their code uh, using SML. And in particular, SML of New Jersey. Um, <laughs> so uh, first project was something called Venari. This was really forward looking. It was looking at software based transactions. Right, so tra transactional memory, which is a hot topic, or has been the last few years. But we were working on it back then. Um, I, I spent a summer at, at Bell Labs working on a parallel version of the New Jersey runtime. Uh, and then I spent a summer at DEC. Uh, you notice Bell Labs and DEC Labs, they're both gone, kind of. So, I mean, it's kind of sad. But um, there I worked on hardware-based transactional memory, which now Intel finally got around to offering. And then this really exciting project that Bob and Peter Lee and some other people started to build an operating system using standard ML. Okay, that, that was really the, the project that I was deeply invested in. Um, so uh, nevertheless, there were some frustrations that we encountered right away. Basically that project, and Bob can correct me if I'm wrong, but we didn't really produce an operating system. We produced a beautiful TCP stack. I mean, it, was, it really used the ML module system in an elegant way, but it was also probably the world's slowest TCP stack until, until uh, Peter Sewell went along and implemented an Isabel TCP. I don't know. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, SML of New Jersey was way too slow for doing systems programming. It used way too much memory. So unlike my advisor, I kind of think the constants matter a little bit. But you know, so, and, and it didn't give, see, he's not paying attention. So, and it didn't give control over data representation. So if you wanted to use mbuffs or you wanted to hack packets or this sort of thing, you basically had to peek and poke into byte arrays. It was very error prone and very slow. So this gave rise to my thesis, which was about compiling SML the way that I was used to, which was uh, I, came, I grew up in the era of Pascal. So Pascal compilers, if you created records uh, or you had an array of floating point values, it wouldn't box all the values. So boxing means place an object in memory and refer to it with a pointer. So you wouldn't box objects in SML, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Pascal, but you do in languages like Haskell and ML and, all the, and Scheme, all the functional languages, everybody would box things. So why would they box things? Well, the real problem was if you're going to go compile, say, ML, even if it's statically typed, the types don't tell you enough to do compilation. Like, what is the size of alpha, right? Is it eight bits, oh, sorry, eight, eight bytes, or is it four bytes? So it depends on whether you're using uh, a 32-bit integer, that alpha is instantiated with a 32-bit integer, or with maybe a 64-bit float. Um, so uh, th this polymorphism was, was sort of a problem, and my thesis was really about, could you compile ML in a way that Pascal compilers worked? Okay, so there were different fixes to this problem. One was, give up on separate compilation. That is, it turns out ML is very restricted, or at least classic ML, so that you only have second class polymorphism. You could just inline all the polymorphic definitions, specialize them, and now you have monomorphic code, poof, you can compile it like it's Pascal. Uh, another option was to, as, as I already said, is to box everything. That is, place everything in memory and refer to it via a pointer, and now you know what the size of alpha is. No matter what, it's just one word. And that leads to indirection and overhead and lack of control over data representations. Then there was this beautiful paper by Xavier Loire in 1994 about how to sort of com combine those two worlds. And I don't have time to go into it, but man, if you want to read a beautiful paper, it was that paper. I loved that paper, but it was wrong. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so Bob and I wrote a paper in, in 95 that, and the basic idea is uh, you don't know what the size of alpha is at compile time, so every time you call a polymorphic function, pass in the definition of alpha at runtime, so you know what it is. And then you can calculate the size of alpha, but maybe at, at runtime instead of at compile time. So lots of work went on there, and, um, and that basically was, was how I, I got my first position. So that was the first big project that I, I sort of went off and worked on. Um, one of the things that we had to do as part of this project was carry type information all the way down through the compiler to the sort of machine code level. And um, we did that in a very systematic way uh, at first, but then sort of in an ad hoc way as we got towards the end of the compiler. 
And I was giving a talk on this project at, at, at ICFP, and uh, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, well, that was really good, but you'll never get the types all the way down to the machine code level. Ooh, that made me mad. <laughs> okay, so I got mad, and I went back, and I had some really smart graduate students who uh, worked with me, and, and no, so we, we came up with a way to compile systematically an ML-like language down to assembly code and to carry the types along as we went. All right, and that, that was the genesis of typed assembly language, and it's probably the one thing that I'm, that I'm somewhat known for. So along the way, we learned lots and lots of stuff. The, you know, so on the one hand, I'm working with assembly language, so I'm way down here in the bowels of, of a compiler, and yet we were learning things about how to use types to capture uh, different kinds of conversions that go on in a compiler, like closure conversion or object conversion, how to capture calling conventions or the layout of stacks and this sort of thing. We ran into problems with spilling, and one of my students started working with something called alias types that was, it turned out to be very closely related to separation logic. Okay, we didn't know that at the time, but we were inventing this stuff as we went. We worked on modules. We even had uh, one of my poor students, oh, he worked on dynamic runtime code generation. That is, you know, think, think, think about eval and being able to type check the code that is going to do the eval to generate the code and make sure that that all works out. Okay, that was amazing. So we had lots of good stuff. And, and one of the things I learned along the way was research is like mining. When you hit a good vein, it's awesome, right? You know, just lots of projects spin off. You're like going great, great, great. And then it kind of peters out, you know. Uh, and, and I got to the point where if I saw another thing about typed assembly language, I was going to throw up. So, uh, so I'm kind of depressed at this point. Furthermore, there were some really hard problems that I couldn't solve, seemed to solve. One of them was Tal still needed a garbage collector. I really did not want to have to have uh, a machine with garbage collection baked in. So right, we didn't do that in practice. We had this assembly language. That's why it wasn't typed machine code. It was a level up and it had a runtime system that you had to trust. I didn't like that. Uh, there were other things that, that went wrong, and, and I was just sick of it. So um, about that time, I moved, and we started working on uh, a different project called Cyclone. And what we'd done, just to demonstrate the effectiveness of TAL, was to compile a little C-like language called Popcorn down to TAL, and just to sort of show off things, and to build various applications. Um, so Popcorn had a number of problems. We decided, hey, this is kind of cool. It looks like C. It has curly braces. <laughs> Maybe systems programmers, we can fool them into actually using this because it has curly braces and so forth. All right, so, so we, and we went a little bit further. This was Trevor Jim and Mike Hicks and a bunch of other good people, Dan Grossman. And so we, we did a clean slate design. We, we basically started with the syntax of C and added in all kinds of features that I like from ML. For instance, we had pattern matching and data types, and we had uh, uh, exceptions and a, a bunch of other things. But maybe most importantly, we had a, a semantic model, and we had a sort of a, a, sort of a type safety guarantee, <laughs> sort of. I say because it was so big and complicated, we never really formalized this to any degree. But the other thing that we focused on was manual memory management. Okay, so. Um, uh, Mads Tofta and Lars Birkedal and a bunch of other people had worked on this really cool project called the ML Kit Compiler where they used uh, a static analysis based on lexically scoped regions to uh, get rid of a garbage collector. Okay. And uh, region-based memory management was something that we incorporated into Cyclone. We also added support for unique pointers and, and some substructural typing and so forth. And that was really a great research project. Um, we also worked on some static extended checking stuff. So uh, if you talk to people like Rustin Leno, he worked on this for a long time. He called it extended static checking. But I call it static extended checking because then you can say it's sexy, right? You know, works a lot better as, a, as an acronym. So we worked on these projects. And you know, looking back on it, I'm trying to decide whether it was a failure or a success. So, we had really two different goals. One was to get C programmers to use it. And actually, we failed miserably at this task because we added in all kinds of crap that C programmers don't care about, like data types and pattern matching. Okay, um, 
Furthermore, um, we kept adding new stuff to the language. And every time you change it, there's a cost, right? But um, I do think, and this is where the patience comes in, we had an influence later on with respect to Rust. So a lot of the ideas in Cyclone got picked up and are now used in Rust. I was very frustrated by the end of this project that nothing had happened. I was depressed. And yet, a few years later, cool people like Ross come along, pick up these ideas, and, and run with them. So sometimes you don't know that you're having an influence, um, and, and it picks up later on. So have some patience. Another mistake in this project was I've spent an enormous amount of time hacking on this. For one thing, wrestling with C syntax and trying to add in support for polymorphism and all the other things was a pain. Uh, but um, I was ex you know, sick of C by the end of this project, and I really wanted to, to go back to my roots, something higher level. So um, one thing just about infrastructure, when you're going to work on an infrastructure project, like if you look at the successful examples like SML of New Jersey or GHC or OCaml or Caulk or Agda and so forth, Somebody put in a lot of work, a lot more work than usually I'm willing to do to make it usable. And you have to walk this line between uh, adding new stuff and changing it and actually having your users absorb it and, and do it. The other problem is I've seen this failure mode in other researchers is you start some big infrastructure project and you get focused on one corner of it and you work on that but you never actually put the whole thing together to where it's usable and you never write it up and it just sort of gets lost in the bit bucket of time. Um, that certainly happened to me, and Cyclone, for exa example, has bit rotted away. You, you can download the code, but you can't possibly build it. All right? um, that's that's kind of sad. Okay, anyway, I got sick of Cyclone uh, and C code, and I wanted to go back to something higher level. I was thinking, I had a great postdoc, Alex Nanevsky at the time, and, and he was, he's a logician, right? So he really hated C code. Um, and, and we started thinking about static extended checking, and, and that I was confronted with this basic problem that you want to put pre and post conditions on your code and you want to generate verification conditions and feed that off to a prover. Um, and, and you could do simple things like get rid of bounce checks on arrays. But it was really hard to eliminate sort of higher level semantic errors that weren't really errors. Like you look up in a hash table a key that you know perfectly well is there. You know you're not going to get the exception not found uh, error, right? Or a null pointer. And, you know, how do you capture that with these, these theorem provers and these VC generators? That's actually pretty hard. So I felt like we needed a real program logic. I didn't know anything about this. Turns out people like Rustin had been working on this for years. So I went off and tried to recreate the same ideas, but maybe from a more type theoretic uh, perspective because I had Alex with me. And we thought we'd just prototype something. The original goal was now we're back up. We're at really high level, right? Build a new ML with support for dependent types. But this time, I realized I don't want to get into the infrastructure trap again, right? Build lots of infrastructure and then have it rot away. So we prototyped first in caulk, and then we realized, oh, crap, those caulk guys are really smart. They've already done everything. <laughs> so we, just, we had to do a few things, but not much, OK? And so we, sh we shifted to treating caulk as a programming language, an imperative programming language within an integrated logic. And that was the why not project. And, and I never did connect it back to Cyclone. OK. So, one point, one of the, the takeaways is that the great thing about being an academic researcher is you're working along on some project, you get sick of it, you want to move to something else, you can. It doesn't happen in industry, right? Your boss tells you <laughs> you want to work on X <laughs> whether you want to or not. Uh, okay, um, another thing I got interested in was security. Uh, and I decided to do something really, really basic because I got frustrated that Nobody in the world seemed to be listening to all of us language researchers. So I worked on something called software fault isolation. This is, again, just trying to impose a basic safety and security policy on x86 code. Oh, crap. Now I'm back down here again. All right. So I can't seem to get away from it. Up and down, up and down. That happens a lot. And we built some tool that I could tell you about later. I won't. Um, then I got tired of x86 again and started working on a, another project mostly because of a friend who'd heard about something called colony collapse disorder. Anybody know what colony collapse disorder? Yeah, all the bees are dying off. We don't know why. That's kind of scary. NSF had this new program where they'd give you $10 million if you came up with a good idea. There's actually, you'll hear about the deep spec project uh, that a bunch of people, okay, that's exactly what those guys did. Okay, but we did a project earlier than that. It was to solve colony collapse disorder by building robotic bees. 
Okay, uh, so the whole idea was to build these little critters that would go flying around a field and pollinate crops for us in case all the bees die off. All right, this was a this was a moonshot kind of project. <laughs> you sound you laugh, but it, I would have to say this is probably the most inventive project that I got involved with in the sense that it was really outside my comfort zone. Um, I didn't know any of the things that I needed to know to actually contribute. In fact, I, I, was, I, was, the, I was not useful at all. <laughs> okay. um, so, I mean, the original proposal said, well, we're going to build thousands of these things. In fact, a swarm of bees is about 4,000. And that I'm going to be responsible for building programming languages to program these swarms of bees. <laughs> Sounded good when we wrote the proposal. In reality, we didn't, we didn't get that. I still have no idea how you program with thousands of robots. But I learned a whole lot working on that project, things that were outside my comfort zone. And, and that was a good thing. When you get tired of what you're working on, when you want to do, go work with somebody else on another project. You'll learn a whole lot, and you'll bring it back. So for example, I was able to work on things like sensor networks and programming languages from that. And I was able to bring in ideas from functional reactive programming, the kind of stuff that Paul Hudak had done in the robotics world there and how to scale that up and translate that to these kinds of settings. Um, I think these are some other good problems that people are, uh, should be worrying about now. So we already saw one today, like how to program at the network level using sort of principled language technology. But there are other emerging domains like, uh, you know, if you have this damned Google car that's driving around on its own using deep learning, uh, how do you guarantee some kind of safety property out of that. Okay, that's a great PL topic. Uh, or, um, you know, if you're doing spatial resolution, high spatial resolution volcanic monitoring the way Matt Welsh was doing, how do you program sensor networks for that? Or if you're working with biological systems like DNA hair, hairpin assemblies, how do you program those and insert into a compiler the sort of right error correcting codes that need to go on because of that inherently stochastic noisy medium that you're working in? PL is good for all these things. And sometimes I think we get focused on core issues, but it's, and those are good, those are very important. But it's also good to pop up and connect to these broader things that will be uh, hitting us in the face in the future. Okay, one, I'm, I'm gonna close up now, and I have just two, two more slides. One is a note on work life. So I remember I had those two little kids there. One thing that I, I think I'm very happy looking back is that I didn't put off having those kids until I had tenure. Right. And in general, I would say one thing you want to think about right now is don't put your life on hold just because you're in grad school or just because you're starting as a position. You want to start forming the habits now that will uh, pervade your lifetime going forward. So if you're putting off the exercising or you're putting off eating right or you're putting off you know, dating or whatever, uh, why? Um, for one thing, uh, especially with kids, the argument for me to go ahead and have them right away was uh, it's not like it gets easier when you get older. So, um, and that's a good point. But it's something to think about now. Okay, let me, I, okay, I told you it was a completely random talk. Um, uh, research is loads of fun and horribly frustrating. You'll get depressed. There are strategies for getting out of the depression. That's the big takeaway. Um, also, I think PL is one of the most flexible fields you can have. You know, you can work on everything from core lambda calculus and bridging things like complexity theory uh, to language and logics to, you know, crazy robo bee kinds of things, all right? And you can have a big impact in that, and you'll learn a whole lot, especially if you value what you're learning as opposed to, you know, just how many papers you get into Popple or something like that. Okay, I'll stop there, and thank you very much. <laughs>